1993, I published Listening to Prozac, a book that grew out of my clinical experience prescribing what was then a new class of medications, ones thought to moderate depression through their effect on the way that the brain handles the neurotransmitter serotonin. Some of my patients had reported marked favorable reactions to the drugs, first Prozac and soon after Zoloft. On medication, the patients were more confident, less anxious, and less pessimistic. In the book, I tried to explain how those effects might occur and then to discuss implications for medical ethics and society at large. How malleable is the self? How open are we to technologies that might change it? Listening to Prozac became a national and international bestseller and has remained in print ever since. The book is now available in a 30th anniversary edition with a new forward and afterward in which I update the science and discuss changes in the cultural status of antidepressants. In brief, we rely on them more, but we respect them less. That was Peter D. Kramer, author of Listening to Prozac and, most recently, the novel Death of the Great Man. He is an emeritus professor of psychiatry and human behavior at Brown University. And he was reading from his recent first opinion essay on listening to Prozac and how Americans' relationship with antidepressants has changed since its publication. After a quick break, I'll bring you our conversation about SSRIs, listening to Prozac, and psychiatry in general. Right now, millions of Americans are making important decisions about their health care coverage for next year. United Healthcare offers a couple tips to help you during this open enrollment period. First, know your enrollment dates. Employer plans typically select a time period in the fall for employees to choose their coverage. Enrollment for Medicare eligible participants runs from October 15th through December 7th. Second, take time to understand the costs of each plan by comparing how much you pay each month, as well as deductibles, copays, and prescription drug coverage. For more tips, visit UHCOpenEnrollment.com. Welcome to the First Opinion Podcast. I'm Tori Bosch, editor of First Opinion. First Opinion is Stat's platform for interesting, illuminating, and provocative articles about the life sciences writ large, written by biotech insiders, healthcare workers, researchers, and more. Peter, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. So as you mentioned in the beginning, you wrote Listening to Prozac after seeing a new generation of antidepressants that were affecting your psychiatry patients in unexpected ways. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about what the antidepressant landscape looked like before Prozac? Yes. So uh, antidepressants were first developed in the late 1950s. A couple of kinds. The most used kind was tricyclics. And they were medicines that had lots of side effects. They made patients constipated. They could cause urine retention in the bladder, which is a medical emergency. It was not hard to overdose on them. And of course, they were being given to patients who inherently might be suicidal. Uh, Internists, uh, family practitioners were reluctant to use them. You had to start low, uh, raise them slowly. They took a long while to work. Uh, and uh, they were probably used by about, you know, one American in 50 per year, reserved largely for quite serious depression. So that was what antidepressants looked like. And within psychiatry as well, I mean, this was still the age of Freud, and uh, it was considered almost a failure of imagination to resort to medication in the treatment of depression. And so how long had you been practicing when Prozac and, uh, and its ilk started to come along? Well, I started seeing patients in medical school in the early 1970s, and Prozac came along in uh, 1987. So, you know, on the order of 10 to 15 years. Um, and I'd been in private practice uh, exclusively uh, starting probably in 1982, so maybe just five years in. Uh, But I don't know that I used them in 1987. They came out late that year. So we're talking really the late 1980s, early 90s. You know, did you start to sort of hear from 
from colleagues, from other psychiatrists saying, you know, hey, this there's this new thing, Prozac. Um, you should give it a try for your patients. So how did you first sort of start hearing about it? Um, you know, I had patients who didn't tolerate the older antidepressants. I had some sense from my contact with researchers I'd known earlier that these medications might be uh, good for what was called atypical uh, depression, where people, uh, you know, slept too much instead of too little. So I tried them out on certain patients. I thought they might be good for patients who were obsessive as well as depressed. Um, but no, I didn't hear much from uh, colleagues. Colleagues really heard from me. I was writing mm -hmm. a monthly column in a trade paper, Psychiatric Times, and I wrote a couple of essays saying, hey, guys and gals, you're probably seeing what I'm seeing, which is that uh, patients are coming in saying that they're better than well, that they are doing better socially, not just uh, recovering from whatever it is we're prescribing the antidepressants for, and that patients are almost turning to the drugs for counsel. They're saying, uh, wow, that aspect of who I am might be biologically based. It might be happenstance because it responds so readily to medication. Uh, and it hadn't responded to past antidepressants and, and you know, hadn't perhaps responded to psychotherapy. And I'm thinking things like being less obsessive and uh, being more comfortable socially. So I was sort of, I was assuming that colleagues were seeing what I was seeing, but I was the one who was saying it. You know, and the result was that when Prozac, for other reasons, started becoming a bit of a celebrity, uh, magazines like Newsweek turned to me as an authority, and not that I was at all an authority, I was a clinician, not a researcher, just because when they searched, you know, in their library of clippings long before Google, uh, the, you know, the uh, librarian would come up with my name. So you say that Prozac was becoming a bit of a celebrity. Was that largely but just because sort of word of mouth about the effect it was having? You know, what was, what was happening? Yeah, it was really word of mouth. I think in the way that people talked about their psychoanalyses, you know, in uh, the advanced cities like in New York and San Francisco, say, uh, they started talking about Prozac. I think, you know, it was sort of a, a crowdsourced phenomenon. Interesting. So, you know, for me, listening to Prozac was really important. I actually read it in college in a uh, course on the history of, uh, of mental health, um, and it was just really sort of eye-opening in the way it started to sort of look into this kind of fuzzy border between mental health, mental illness, and, and personality. Um, what made you start to think that, hey, I think there's, there's a book in this? You know, I, I was uh, at an American Psychiatric Association conference, and Tony Burbank, who was an editor at Bantam Doubleday Dell, gave a talk on, you know, sort of how to sell your book. And I actually had a book out at that time or coming out called Moments of Engagement about psychotherapy. But a colleague of mine who was, uh, you know, a writer said, let's go to that talk. And after it, I uh, went up to her, and I don't know if she was already familiar through the columns or if I suggested something, but she said, let's meet in my office. So I, you know, uh, and the, the APA meeting happened to be in New York. So I went over to one of these, you know, glass and metal uh, skyscrapers with uh, impressive offices and sat down and discussed this possibility. And she was just terrific. She said, this really is a strong book idea, and I would buy it today, but you should get an agent. And that was really how I got a literary agent. So, you know, as you were writing this, did you start to tell your patients, you know, hey, I'm working on this book about Prozac, and you know, were you asking them sort of to reflect on things? You know, did you involve them in any way with, uh, with the writing process? A lot of the observation had actually taken place before I wrote the book. I think those huh. early responses were the ones I wrote about for colleagues in the columns, which were, you know, two or three years prior. But there's another way into this book, and it's, you know, I wrote a new introduction afterward in this 30th anniversary edition. I talk about my way in. By pure happenstance, I had a strong research background I'm not a researcher, 
But in an attempt to uh, get to Washington, where my future wife was, to uh, be, you know, uh, with her uh, while I was still in residency, I took a job in the government. It was meant to be a job in community psychiatry. That job disappeared, and I was assigned to work with Jerry Clareman, one of the great, uh, you know, researchers in psychotherapy outcome and depression treatment in general, antidepressants. And um, he put me eventually in charge of an agency where I had to have familiarity with all the research, every uh, research grant that the federal government gave, NIMH, the Veterans uh, Association, Veterans uh, Administration, and so on. And so I, and of course we had the money, so research, researchers came to us. I got to know a lot of the uh, American researchers involved in a range of fields from cell biology to animal, animal ethology. And when I started proposing this book, I thought, I really want to explain how this is possible. How is it possible that people are getting personality change effects out of medications uh, designed to treat depression? Uh, and it was just one of those moments, you know, it doesn't happen twice in a lifetime, where I was perfectly prepared for the task. I think it's hard to overstate the importance of the book when it came out and just how much discussion this sort of marriage of vignettes about patients plus the research that you brought to it, you know, really started a conversation or, you know, turned up the volume on a conversation about the role of antidepressants. Can you tell us a little bit about the reception to it? The reception was extraordinary. You know, I've written that the book was a national and international bestseller, but that wasn't the impact. It was just the subject of discussion incessantly for half a year and maybe a year. Uh, the book was really meant to be about the nature of the self, how much is the self carefully, uh, you know, developed through our aspirations and our self-image and so on, and how much of it is, as I say, biological happenstance. And how are, is the availability of the, these medications going to affect our view of that? It arrived at a time when there was a great interest in depression. William Styron had written an op-ed in the New York Times about his own depression and turned it into Darkness Visible, uh, which I think was the first memoir of its generation, which really, uh, first of all, discuss, uh, made depression something discussable by eminent people and also took depression to be an illness. And uh, Styron was not particularly high on either medication or psychotherapy. He had a lot of trouble uh, getting over his episode, and it probably you know, may have been complicated by alcohol, uh, alcohol consumption. But um, you know, th this book entered that environment and in some ways became a focal point for discussions of depression and antidepressants in general, and not that just this issue about uh, the self and medical ethics. I had coined the term cosmetic psychopharmacology, which, which had to do with the notion, you know, if we could tweak personality in people who aren't really, you know, suffering from a mental illness, is that a doctorly function? Uh, should we walk away from it and so on? Yeah, and this gets to something that I think about a lot, which is that, you know, sometimes I think at this point, we say mental health to mean mental illness, right? With this idea that referring to illness is, is somehow stigmatized. But it does seem to me sometimes that you can be mentally not terribly healthy, but not exactly mentally ill. And, you know, maybe some of your observations about SSRIs get into that area between having a diagnosable illness and maybe not being perhaps the best version of yourself. Yeah, so we complain a lot, writers complain a lot about overdiagnosis nowadays. But the height of people not being normal was probably the 1960s where everybody was neurotic. You know, there were these <laughs> surveys where nobody was mentally healthy. And I think, you know, part of the impact of Prozac was it really did treat either neurosis or there's a term of art, neuroticism. It, it made people less anxious, less self-critical, and, uh, you know, pushed them a little more toward alpha status, uh, you know, gave, made them socially confident in that way. Uh, so that a lot of it, what, what it was treating 
might at one time have been called mental illness, but it, it wasn't illness in the kind of more severe form that we, you know, when we medicalize uh, uh, mental illness today. Uh, you know, it's, it wasn't, you didn't have to be all that depressed probably to benefit from antidepressants. And the cases I discussed in listening to Prozac were largely people who had lesser versions of whatever it was we were treating, obsessionality or, or more often depression. So, you know, as you mentioned, when Prozac and, and Zoloft and, and all, all of the others started to come out, um, they really sort of introduced people to this idea that became very popular that these drugs were correcting an imbalance in the brain of serotonin. Um, I mean, can you talk maybe a little bit about how that helped people embrace, you know, as you say, the sort of medicalization of mental illness? You know, what might that have done for for acceptance? So it's not that imbalance, you know, wasn't a phrase that psychiatrists never used. Critics of psychiatry have gotten back in the literature and found places where it exists. But I think within the field, it was understood from the 1950s that these medicines that affected serotonin and other similar transmitters like norepinephrine and so on might not be pointing to the cause of depression. It might not be that depression was caused by difficulties in the way that the brains handle these transmitters. Um, although, you know, that has remained a possibility uh, for a long time and really just about up to now. Scientists are still very interested in serotonin and its role, causal role or, line or sustaining role for depression. Now, there has been a strong anti-psychiatry movement. In the old days, it complained about psychoanalysis, that it normalized people too much, but it morphed quickly into being a criti critique of uh, the medical model and the use of medication, you know, and electromagnetic treatments in particular, the ideas that depression really is part of the human condition and should be uh, treated with attention to uh, the social environment, adversity, and so on. And uh, so these critics latched on to the notion of an imbalance and said, scientists never have found an imbalance in the brain of these chemicals. And there's a recent article out by Joanna Moncrief and others saying that serotonin, you know, the role of serotonin in causing or sustaining depression hasn't been demonstrated. Well, two comments on that. First of all, that doesn't say the medicines don't work. They work or don't work, you know, and there are outcome trials that show that they work. Uh, and uh, secondly, it really does not characterize the field's relationship to serotonin, which, um, you know, still remains reasonably important in the research. And thirdly, it has nothing to do with listening to Prozac because that relationship <laughs> between how the brain handles serotonin and these personality traits, you know, is strong. It occurs throughout the animal kingdom, the lobster you know, monopolizing the food supply is going to be a high serotonin lobster. Uh, when Prozac is in the water supply, crayfish become too bold and endanger themselves by coming out of hiding too often. I mean, really, the relationship between serotonin and uh, what we would call broadly personality traits is pretty well established. Yeah, and the the reaction to that paper, I, I guess it was early this year or or last year, but... But wow, um, what is time at this point? Um, the reaction to that paper was really sort of startling with, with some people saying that they thought they had been lied to by their physicians or maybe more accurately by, by marketers. I'm, I'm curious what you thought about that backlash in general. Well, I mean, yes. I, I think it's true that we don't know enough about depression to say some of the things that doctors probably said. Um, on the other hand, we know a lot about depression, and I think to the extent that doctors were saying, we have a pretty good biological basis for wanting to offer you this medicine, and we know how destructive depression is in general. I mean, the popular view of the modal depressed patient you know, is probably a grad student who can't finish his or her thesis and, uh, you know, is struggling and turning to a medication. And the modal depressed patient is probably, you know, a single mother who's undereducated and underemployed relative to 
her abilities and social status because depression has stood in the way. I mean, it's, it's a really bad ailment. And, um, you know, I was, when I met all those scientists, I was in the Carter administration and one of our public health goals was to get primary care doctors to recognize and treat depression. And I think Prozac in a way really did that job. It was, you know, easy enough to prescribe. It was well enough accepted by patients. It probably had these other effects that patients liked. And we started, um, you know, treating depression medically. So I just want to step back a second to what you were saying about sort of the different kind of models, you know, that there's, you know, the depressed person who might be a grad student who can't finish their dissertation, and then there's the single mother whose conditions in life might be making her depressed. Is it sort of like depression might be a big category that lumps in a bunch of different things? Yeah, so I would say that the field believe psychiatry, psychology, that there are going to be many depressions the way there are many roots into things like autism and schizophrenia, which are Mm -hmm. well studied in this regard. Uh, I am sort of a a rear guard, you know, resistor. I think that there may be a biological bottleneck and there are lots of ways to get to depression. If you have a thyroid disorder or you have a problem with blood vessels in your brain or you know, if you have terrible adversity or if you have a bad, you know, genetic input, uh, there are lots of ways to come to depression and probably combinations of those. But there may be something that gives these depressions a lot in common because so much of it does respond to the same treatments. I mean, it's these, there are lots of complaints that these medicines don't work. Well, they, prior, my prior nonfiction book is called Ordinarily Well, and it's about what the research really is about the efficacy of antidepressants. They work quite well. We have trouble testing antidepressants now because, you know, for 10 cents a pill, you can be on Prozac. Your internist will prescribe it. If you respond to it, you're not going to go into a drug study. And we're left with very complicated patients with, you know, often with drug and alcohol abuse, severe suicidality, who haven't responded to five or six medicines. They, you know, they're in the studies. And yeah, they don't do so well on the new meds, and they do pretty well because they're getting a lot of social support through being in the study, being driven to the study, socializing with other patients on the way. You know, it's very hard to run those studies. So yeah, antidepressants don't look like they're doing so well right now because they've done so well. They will, you know, they, so if people are willing to take medication, they're probably doing well on medication already. Wow, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about how, right, you know, if it's easy to just tell your general practitioner that you're feeling a sort of mild but persistent depression and Lexapro works for you nicely, yeah, you're not going to seek out either a psychiatrist or clinical trials that end up taking up a lot of your time it might right. be right i mean oddly more the difficult. the one set of drugs that may be an exception to this is the psychedelics you know their psychedelics <laughs> are being tested for depression and even people who do fairly well on uh, the drugs we're discussing may decide oh yeah i want to enter a psychedelic trial of course the problem there is you get people entering psychedelic trials who are optimistic about psychedelics, are interested in psychedelics, have done well on psychedelics in the past. So you're getting kind of a strange population in those studies. But it, instead of being an unfavorable one, it's a favorable one. <laughs> um, I want to get back to the big point you made in your recent first opinion essay, which is that you know Americans are using antidepressants more, but respecting them less. And I, I think you're right that there is this sort of colloquial shift in that, you know, I don't think I hear any more necessarily about the phenomenon you discuss in listening to Prozac of someone going on Zoloft and then saying, you know, not only has my depression lifted, but I'm being nicer to people or more generous. You know, is there, is it, is it possible that sort of the novelty of the drugs at that time might have had some effect on those kinds of reactions? Well, yes, the novelty was very important because no one had been on them. Mm. So you were getting an entirely, uh, you know, population that was naive to Prozac. You were getting all first responses at the same time. You know, that only happens once. And so that was in the late 80s, early 90s. 
I think it's true that we're blasé about them. I mean, for all of human history, since Hippocrates, doctors have won, the public, you know, have wanted uh, a medication treatment for depression. We, you know, have had them for half a century. Uh, if you were going to be depressed any time in history and, you know, were interested in having an effective treatment, you would want to be alive now. Uh, but we've lost our wonderment about that. Um, I think, you know, there are all kinds of other factors. One is this kind of anti-psychiatry bent. There are Prozac survivors groups, the people who go on social media with the most energy are people who uh, claim to be injured by the medicines or were injured by the medicines. You, you know, never have heard a lot from people who just want to speak up and say they were mentally ill and are doing better now. Um, so, you know, I think that has affected the uh, environment. Um, you know, I think we live in psychiatry with our failures. As uh, internists get people better, you know, more and more of any specialist practice will be people who don't do well on the available current medications. And in general, through the whole culture, there are people who have spent a lot of years not doing well on the available treatments. By the way, psychotherapy is a very good treatment for depression. We haven't discussed that. But, you know, people who have not done well with either psychotherapy or medication or both, there's still lots of people who have not had a good trial of either. We, you know, we may be giving a lot of these medicines, but we also have big pockets of the population who are not not treated at all. Um, yeah, but I, yes, uh, I th and I think also test, we, we have a broader view of depression. In the old days, if somebody had a, an acute episode of depression and she, say, uh, you know, was not suicidal any longer and was able to sleep and eat normally and was speaking at a normal pace uh, and, you know, was not feeling hopeless, but still was kind of pessimistic and obsessive and shy and socially withdrawn. That was a great victory. You had, you had ended the episode of depression. I think nowadays people include a lot of what I call temperament uh, issues or personality traits in depression, and they would say if they're still socially anxious, they're still depressed. So to some extent, it's a question of definition. That's really interesting. So, you know, I know you're you're no longer in private practice right now, but if you had to guess, you know, where do you think um, antidepressants are, are heading next? You know, do you think, is it psychedelics? Is it some new wave? Or, you know, are, are Prozac and the rest of the SSRIs likely to continue to be our best bet? I think it's a very interesting time to observe and a promising time for antidepressants. You know, we are testing ketamine and psychedelics. There's this drug uh, related to allopregnanolone, a hormone that goes up and down in pregnancy and delivery that uh, is given as a long infusion or just given as pills for two weeks as a treatment for postpartum depression. Very interesting. You know, if you could treat people with pills for two weeks and then have them off pills for, you know, say nine months and have them do better for nine months until they need another treatment, that would be very interesting. We'd see the difference between, you know, the effects of being on medication chronically and the effect of just having the depression uh, treated in this more compact fashion. Um, so I think it's an interesting time. I, I, I don't know. I, I think for all that we complain about them, the medicines like Prozac and Zoloft and Lexapro are pretty effective, pretty well tolerated. And I, in a way, would be surprised if they didn't have a continuing role even after we start embracing these newer treatments. And as a long parenthesis or footnotes, we really don't know enough about ketamine and the psychedelics. They're being widely adopted. People swear by them. There are lots of, you know, tremendous success stories. But the research is still very early. If you, you know, embrace that research, you had better embrace the research that says that these earlier medicines are effective. Yeah, and I should note that um, my, my stat colleague, Olivia Goldhill, has done some fantastic reporting on psychedelics and and the boom and the the challenges coming with them. Um, so now before we wrap up, I do want to talk really briefly about um, another piece you wrote for First Opinion in the spring related to the publication of your novel, Death of the Great Man. Um, can you tell us really briefly about that novel? 
So it's uh, been characterized by The Atlantic as a Trump on the couch novel. It's about a uh, <laughs> psychiatrist whose life is uh, upset when he's corralled into treating a uh, buffoonish, narcissistic autocrat in his disastrous and stolen second term. And the book begins as that autocrat is found dead on the psychiatrist's couch in Providence, Rhode Island. And the poor uh, doctor has to go on the run and explain uh, what he knows about the lead up to that uh, unexpected and sudden death. So it has the form uh, of a murder mystery or political thriller. It's meant as literary fiction. And it has a lot to do with psychotherapy. I mean, we are with this doctor as he uh, is trying to bring all his empathy and uh, technical skills uh, to the treatment of an extremely unlikable patient. Now, if you were still in private practice, would you accept um, an autocrat as a as a patient? Oh, absolutely. You know, <laughs> we love challenges. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I should highly suggest that anyone um, listening to this read the first opinion you wrote, as well as the novel, of course. Uh, the first opinion is fascinating, focused on whether AI might be able to diagnose mental illness from afar in public figures, which would sort of get around the endless debates we see every election cycle around the Goldwater rule and whether um, whether professionals should diagnose um, potential mental health conditions in politicians. Yes. Well, Peter D. Kramer, thank you so much for joining us today. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Me too. Thank you for listening to the First Opinion Podcast. It's produced by Teresa Gaffney. Alyssa Ambrose is senior producer, and Rick Burke is the executive producer. If you have any feedback on the podcast or ideas for what the column should cover, please email me at first.opinion at statnews.com and sign up for the First Opinion newsletter, which comes out every Sunday. And if you have a minute, I know I'm asking again, please rate and review the podcast on platforms. Until next time, I'm Tori Bosch, and please don't keep your opinions to yourself.